All right, welcome back to Blake's Business Morning Show. It's Tuesday, March 8th, and let's dive into some business news, starting with yesterday's stock market. Stocks were down again as the war in Ukraine is still no end in sight. And so stocks are continuing to, to be quite volatile. And uh, yesterday was another down day with the Dow shedding almost 800 points, the S&P dropping nearly 3%, and the NASDAQ dropping over 3% and almost in bear market territory. For the year, that brings the S&P down almost 12%, the Dow down almost 10%, and the NASDAQ down almost 8%. Percent. Uh, Bitcoin also down 1.9 percent. Ethereum down 4.3 percent. The only places in the market that are really up are gold and oil, as oil topped above $130 a barrel for a hot second, and gold up and down over $2,000 per troy ounce, which is a significant, significant marker uh, for gold. Very high. Very expensive. And, and that's, you know, a combination of different things causing that. Uh, inflation being one of the biggest. And then now the war uh, is going to continue to push inflation ahead, especially in the oil markets, with the potential shortage and ban of Russian natural gas, uh, which could send the energy markets into, into a, a very crazy place over the next few months. I went to fill up yesterday. It was over $4 a gallon here in Fort Worth, Texas, which is unheard of. I haven't seen prices at the pump like that in a very, very long time. I don't even know if ever. Maybe maybe back in 2014, but I'm pretty sure oil didn't get this high then. It was, or at least it was close, but wasn't driving back in, you know, probably the last time that that happened. So let's dive into our top stories of the day. The first big one, you all know I'm a Bill, big Bill Ackman fan. And Bill Ackman is back in Canadian Pacific, the Canadian railway company, with a stake that tops a billion dollars uh, as the railroad seeks to merge with Kansas City Southern. And this is significant because Ackman waged an intense activist campaign and proxy war for board seats back in 2012. Uh, ended up selling his stake for a profit uh, in 2016, but considers it one of his biggest investment regrets, not keeping it longer. So this time around, the investment seems to be much friendlier than the first time where he waged an all-out war. Uh, he's quoted as saying, we're delighted again to be an owner of this remarkable and growing franchise at a time when transcontinental rail infrastructure could not be more important for our economy and our continent. So investment to keep an eye out. Uh, if the merger happens, that'll make, if not the largest, one of the largest railroads in North America. Uh, so pretty interesting there. Uh, interesting tidbit that Bill Ackman has gotten back into Canadian Pacific uh, after almost a four-year proxy war and, and turnaround plan. Uh, been out for six years. Now he's back in. Next up on the big stories list, this, we're going back to Russia. We're going back to sanctions as Boeing may have a big Russian titanium problem as the company has suspended parts of its business in Russia. Uh, but we'll have to untangle themselves from their joint venture uh, that is headed up by former KGB and close Putin ally, Sergei Cheminov. Chim Azov. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. I couldn't find an internet pronunciation for Chimisov or Kimisov. Uh, but yeah, so he is on the sanctions list. He is a ex-KGB, was essentially gifted this piece of the industry, it sounds like, from Putin. Uh, and Boeing has had a long-standing relationship and joint venture. Uh, and it's one of their key suppliers of titanium, a pretty crucial piece of making airplanes. Uh, so it's a 50-50 split in this JV uh, between Boeing and Russian arms company Rostec. And it sounds like that the sanctions aren't going to directly affect the partnership. Boeing can still do business with that partnership if they want, but they can't sign deals individually with Sergei Chiminov. Uh, Chim as of, man, I, I, you know, Tuesday morning, acting like a Monday morning. 
And Boeing, it's the, uh, another interesting piece of this is that Boeing has not made an official announcement about whether they're going to leave Russia. Uh, so very interesting there. Uh, but they did note that supply shortages for future could disrupt future production, meaning that they are probably going to stop using Russian titanium in the short term and will be heavily leading on uh, their suppliers from other nations such as the U.S., Japan, and Kazakhstan. So that's a big big story of the day. We've got a couple more. We're diving in a little bit of stock market action as Occidental Petroleum, rather famous company, Warren Buffett bought in with preferred stock to help them purchase Anadarko a few years back. Kyle, I Carl Icahn got in and uh, waged an activist campaign. Uh, not as heaviest activist, activist campaign, but an activist campaign all the less. And Carl Icahn is selling out. He's officially out of his stake as of last week, while Warren Buffett has doubled down, buying $5 billion more of Occidental while Carl, or Carl Icahn was selling. Uh, so it's an interesting class. This is not the first time the two have been on the opposite sides of a trade like this. They both were getting in and out of Apple at a similar time as Carl Icahn exited his stake in... I can't remember the year. You can look it up if you want to know more about it. But he exited the stake and essentially Warren Buffett jumped in and bought a huge stake, which is interesting. I mean, they're both very, very... It was 2016. I just happened to find it in the article. Nice. Very interesting because they're very different types of investors. Carl Icahn, heavy activist. He comes in. He pushes for change. He gets board seats. He makes company better. He gets out. Almost like a... No, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say almost like private equity, but not really. You you could get the you know the comparison if I were to make it, but it's not truly the same ball game. But Warren Buffett very much likes high moat businesses, uh, free cash flow, loves to be very hands off, loves to trust a management team, and so. It really does have some good yin and yang where when Carl Icahn leaves, he's taken his profits, leaves it in a steady state. Warren Buffett's like, hey, this is a this is a business that's ready for me to come in and invest for the long term. So interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, if Warren Buffett's in it, usually he believes that it's, it's a very good long term play. At 91, he has been, you know, over the last kind of half decade... He's been very prominent in saying that there aren't a lot of good deals on the market. Uh, things are, are very lofty valuations. And so this is interesting to see him get into Occidental Petroleum for even more at this time. So a little interesting tidbit there. And we'll finish off our kind of news with a, a little bit of a macro trend that's happening uh, in the office market, specifically in New York City. Uh, so a lot of the big news has been that Google, Facebook are gobbling up office space at a kind of unprecedented level while still touting flexibility for their workplaces versus some of the major tenants of the city, specifically financial institutions like JP Morgan, have been wanting their employees back in the office uh, for quite some time and are really talking about a future of in the office three, four, or five days a week, not so much talking about flexibility. Yet, J.P. Morgan, the city's largest tenant, cut its commercial footprint by 400,000 square feet last year, along with a slew of other uh, banking or financial entities, including Wells Fargo, reducing by 600,000, Bank of New York Million, dropping uh, financial index provider MSCI, and Voya Financial, all downsizing their footprint, both nationally and in New York City. So an interesting juxtaposition to watch as J.P. Morgan shrinks their footprint for now while touting getting people back in the office, especially in the front of office, investment bank, trading, things like that, while the flexible workspaces of Google, Facebook, and the likes are gobbling up office space at an unprecedented rate. Uh, and I think they're, they're about to start asking for people to come back to the office more often is what it seems. I mean, Apple has started to make a plan to come back to the office. And so the question will be, how does this play out? Does Do financial institutions continue to shed office space and kind of 
maybe true transition part of their workforce to more remote, whereas keeping the, the front of office activities in the office versus our Facebook and Google, are they going to expand their offices and make their their timing more flexible, give them more people more space? Uh, it'll be interesting to see. It's just a macro theme that I've seen. Uh, the article came out in The Real Deal about the kind of the reduction of space. Obviously, New York City office space has been hit by the pandemic and has not, you know, come up to pre-pandemic levels as of yet. So, you know, that it is what it is. And uh, we'll finish off the day with some financial history with Jason Zweig. Give me a second. I should have had it pulled up first. All right. March 8th, 1955, Harvard, oh, yikes, I really am talking like it's a Monday, tongue-tied on a Tuesday morning, not the best, not the best. Harvard Economy's professor, John Ginneth Galbraith, testifies before the U.S. Banking Senate Banking Committee, warning the market is overheating with a substantial element of speculation. With radio stations carrying his remarks live, the market drops even as Galbraith Gilbraith talks. The ticker ends up running nine minutes late and Dow closes down 2%. When Gilbraith breaks his leg skiing later that week, he gets letters from any investors saying their prayers had been answered. Mm. It's not my favorite news I've seen. But interesting. And I mean, that is an interesting, you know, a little tidbit. 1817 is a little bit more interesting. The New York Stock Exchange and Board Ancestors of the New York Stock Exchange is formed when 24 brokers agree on a constitution that fixes commissions at 0.25% and sets a fine of at least six cents for talking out loud about other subjects while stocks are being traded. Interesting, that's kind of a little bit of a formalization in the stock market as we know it. 1817 was a long time ago, so I assume that 25 cent and six cent rate was quite a bit different can get you quite a bit more than it can today but that's it for today's episode of blake's business morning show thanks for coming back i gotta get the rust off get back to doing it every day took a little hiatus um focusing on other content things so good to be back it's been fun as always you can check out this again on youtube or on facebook if you're actually watching it live uh, but go subscribe to our channels, you know, Blake's Businessman on Instagram, TikTok, subscribe to the YouTube, like us on Facebook. Anything you can do is a great help to me in growing the channel. So thank you for watching, and uh, I'll be back soon, probably tomorrow, hopefully. See ya.